What giant said was never so bright as you
fire coursing through his veins to worry he ran To bang her if it all was true, to pray to understand So hear the tale, true heart said her love belonged to his brother And cursed he did the new father Cause she should be if she didn't love he Should be content with the word Cause she will be if she doesn't love he
caffeine So my vibe nights fulfill me Thick and black my will remain So my vibe nights come through me In the promised deeds no man can think For my life night you teach me The darkness calls and bleeds the sting No mother night you reach me And I need the calling of the dark and free Yes.
so easily you're giving up Dear brother, I expect more from you For know me well, you surely do
Don't fear The things that happen to you now can't be helped Be strong and think of your love, your strength
fait tout tour, n'a vol air si spour. La fille est tout tournée. J'ai rien à insérer, ou non d'étier. J'ai eu, tout roulé sur mon identité. Et il t'a donné mon cri sur mon linge. Lai, diris ma touche à l'entrée en tine à l'aïe. Lai, non, hai non chrené et folage. Zoltine, j'ai ri mon chai. J'ai ri mon chai.
shining star Once again light you are Broken lives are mended Though minds never forget their scars
the streets were never more grateful to be walked upon until she was born. And when she's finished bathing, how her absence brought her mourns. The sky would blush in the setting sun underneath her lovely gaze. That her eyes should come to rest upon the moon, it stays.
has left my chest My life, my love is gone I failed my land, my lady Now everything is wrong I should have stood my ground I should have made them fall I feel I failed Aina, I couldn't stop them all But sire, don't lose hope Look to the rising sun You still have a Ryan And she is everyone The seed of your true love Lies in this shining gem Her powers are the greatest We've seen in all the land There can be no more doubt that evil will be back And without some defenses our empire will crack But how can I go on? And how can we survive? I'm only left to hope that our love will stay alive We don't know where they are We don't know what is done She's out there all alone and he's already won but sire, keep your faith Look to the rising sun You still have Oriana And she is everyone The seed of your true love Lies in this shining gem Her powers are the greatest We've seen in all the land There can be no more doubt that evil will be back And without some defenses our empire will crack Then take her far from here that is the only way Our star will be protected Until that fated day Then fight she must be silent And pray must we to win For with our riding There can be peace again
more from you For know me well you surely do But I'm a chair my mind is to you Our setting is the peaceful land of Aina, a wondrous and prospering country with a beautiful people. All had lived in happiness and sunlight for as long as anyone could remember or learn in history from far, far back in the ages. There had been only an echo of a rumor, of a legend of an evil deity and black, desperate souls living in a barren place of existence too far away to matter. Then, suddenly, one day, the divinities sent down a warning to the oracles. The three readers stood before their king, King Taetius Ainan, aghast and ashen with news of visions of violent and desolate scenes forthcoming in their lands. But the mighty king just laughed at their worries, reminding them that they had never known anything but peace and prosperity. The Silver Maiden, Oria Alihahan, fairest in all of time and being, was loved and adored by many, but namely and secretly by Torek Ainan, prince and future king of Eindahaj. But Talon, brother of Torek, also pined for her affections unbeknownst to anyone in the land. On the very day that Torek was making arrangements and gathering up the courage to proclaim the fair Oria as his choice for future queen, Talon happily announces that he and Oria are deeply in love and are to be wed ere the month's end. Torek goes to Oria, begging to know if it's true. She says that it is indeed, whereupon he professes his love, asking her to be his bride. She refuses, saying she loves Talon, not he, powerful though his position may be. Furious and heartbroken, Torek storms out of the castle of Ainan, never again to be seen. Filled with an ever blackening rage, Torek sets out and travels far beyond the known realms. He finally comes to rest in a forsaken land where a hideous breed of creature dwells, the Krakon. They immediately name him their lord, as they believed in and worshipped the evil god Sorva, and believed him to look as Torek did upon his arrival. 
mean and bloated, with a menacing power of hatred burning in his eyes. There they bore him gifts and built him a towering fortress of a cold metal that sucked any warmth or beauty out of its surroundings. This new home he chose to nurse the great hatred growing within him, destined as his empire, he named Nashtok. As time goes by, his hatred mounts, along with his desire for revenge. And as his hatred grows, his body swells to accommodate it, and he becomes a great and evil beast of profound strength and terrifying menace, becoming unrecognizable to any who once knew and loved him as Torek, Prince of Aina. He becomes Sorva, god of blackness and destruction. He nurtures the grotesque and horrific Krakon, making of them a loyal army of deadly force. The day comes many years from when he disappeared from Aina, when he marches his armies there, destroying much and killing many brutalizing and defiling his once beloved land and people. But his eye is on the castle Ainan, where his brother Talon now rules as king, and Oria. He storms the castle, defeating Talon to a bloody heap on the floor, and drags Oria out screaming, leaving their newborn daughter, Oriana, with her beloved and now lifeless king. Sorva leaves Aina having his prize in his arms and marches victorious back to Nashtok. His army stays a while longer to further torture and bring terror to those of the blessed land, but eventually withdraws back to the stench of Nashtok. Talon is tended to by the great healers and makes a full recovery, though his heart remains crushed and torn by his great loss. He bids his kinsmen to take his precious Oriana away into the foothills of the mighty mountains of Lucienne, as she is their last hope. She's given the name Nali to disguise her true identity as the Princess of Aina and proves over the years to possess an incredible power and beauty even beyond her mother's, the likes of which no one has ever seen before. Oria was taken back to Nashtok, where she was raped by Torek again and again, and eventually bears him a son, given the name Cyrus. He is raised to love destruction and war, and hate the land and people of Aina, especially King Talon and the House of Ainar. Oria is kept prisoner, barely able to keep her wits about her high above in the fortress of Nashtok. She is allowed out only to eat and to tutor Cyrus, whom she loves despite his violent conception and who, she believes, possesses some potential goodness and beauty, despite the evil teachings of his father. She dreams of and longs for her land, her people, and her sweet talon, mourning her loss of all of them. And on occasion she is visited by Sorva, who whispers his cold desires in her ear, and chills her to the bone. One day, Cyrus is riding across the plains with a band of his soldiers when he comes to a lake at the foothills of Lucienne. There, he sees a beautiful maiden bathing in the waters and bids her to come talk with him. They find much to say to one another and make plans to meet the following day by the water. As their meetings continue, they grow fond of each other, each oblivious to the other's identity. 
Sirius finds a strange warmth growing in his chest where he's only known cold hardness, and the beautiful maiden feels confused by her feelings for this dark and mysterious traveler. Over time, their meetings become more intense, and they feel more and more of a connection between each other that neither fully comprehends, as though they were like souls destined for a like purpose. Finally, Sirius arrives late one evening, explaining that he's needed to make preparations for something monumental that is going to happen, which will make him a powerful man indeed. A powerful man who needs a queen to rule at his side. The maiden falls into his arms, and they make love. An ever-darkening sky brooding above them, and the tides of fate flowing their way. In the midst of this budding love, Sorvar is planning another attack on Aina, as the Ainai are growing in strength and preparation for war against Nashtok. Messengers of the House of Ainan are sent to the foothills of Lucien, where it is announced that Nali is needed to aid her father and people in Aina's last effort for freedom to overcome the evil of Sorvar. Days before the armies of Nashtok are to march over the plains to Aina, Sirius goes to seek comfort in his love one last time before they shall rule together. He finds, however, that she is not there and can find her nowhere. He is torn between the evil preparations of his father and the sweetness and light he has known with his lovely maiden by the water. His mind is preoccupied and confused as he speeds back to his dark homeland to lead his father's forces to war on the hated land of Aina, this time to rule completely and indefinitely occupy all the land. Its people are ready for them, however led with a new hope in their hearts by the return and wonder of their princess Oriana, whose powers have grown to unimaginable strengths. As the armies of the House of Ainaan come to the borders of their land, headed by King Talon and Princess Oriana, they meet the oncoming of Sirius and the demons of Nashtok. A confused Sirius sees his precious Nali at the front of the defense of Aina and halts his company, holding up his hand in a token of parley. He suggests a meeting of leading commanders to perhaps come to a truce and seek some answers for his reeling mind. Sorvar sees what is happening from afar and reaches his hand down out of the sky, crushing and killing his own son. His face appears in the swirling dark clouds, screaming to Oriana how dare she turn his own son away from him and love her own brother. Crouching down on the battlefield, cradling her dead love in her arms, whom she now realizes was of her own blood, a sadness and wrath steals over her as she's never known before. A white light pours forth from her and she rises into the sky, singing a song of lament for all the people manipulated and attacked by the menace of Sorvar. The purity of her love and pity reaches out across the distances to Nashtok, following the line of hate and despair, and destroying Sorvar and all his evil. The Krakon flee, abandoning their weapons, retreating back from whence they came. 
The company of Aina march on to Nashtok to destroy what's left of the fortress and behold their victory. And lo, there emerges from the rubble the fair silver maiden Oria Aliahan Ainan. The family of the house of Ainan is reunited and peace is restored. The people of Aina emerge better, stronger, more beautiful and full of love than ever before. Oriana is forever haunted by the revelation of Cyrus as her brother and the loss of him, her love. But she goes on to lead her people in peace and prosperity, becoming the greatest queen in all of time.